Nagorno-Karabakh is one of those regions that you didn't even know existed until two weeks ago. Suddenly, it's now all over the media because it's the scene of the first open war between two nations that we've seen in a long time. Here on Visual Politic, we often talk about asymmetric warfare, guerrillas, or maybe civil wars, but it seemed that open wars were kind of a thing of the past. However, from Sunday, the 27th of September, 2020, until the time of making this video, the war between Azerbaijan and Armenia has clocked up more than 6,000 deaths, including about 50 civilians. Of course, those numbers could be even higher, because at least for now, the war is not over. There is a real risk that we will end up seeing ethnic cleansing or even genocide. The reason for all this conflict is the issue of control of Nagorno-Karabakh. We are talking about a region of 4,400 square kilometers with about 150,000 inhabitants. Officially, this territory belongs to Azerbaijan. But in reality, almost the entire population is ethnically Armenian. Sadly, this is not the first time that something like this has happened in this region. The first war in Nagorno-Karabakh broke out in the late 1980s and ended the lives of more than 30,000 people, as well as rendering 1 million people displaced from both Armenian and Azerbaijani backgrounds. Since then, minor skirmishes between the two armies have been a regular occurrence. In fact, in 2016, there was another clash that left almost 200 soldiers dead from both sides and had 15 civilian victims. We're talking about a conflict that goes back decades and in which the great powers are unsure which side to support. For the moment, the only country that has taken sides is Turkey, which supports the Azeris. On Friday the 9th of October, Russia sat Armenia and Azerbaijan down with the objective of achieving a ceasefire. But hours later, the Azerbaijani guns were again bombing the capital of Nagorno-Karabakh, a city called Stefanakert. Many media sources are reporting this war as if it were an invasion by Azerbaijan over Armenian territories. But the real story is much more complex. Which one is right? Baku or Yerevan? It is very difficult to have an opinion in this case, but in this video, we are going to outline at least the main issues behind the conflict. And I know what many of you are probably thinking. This is not the first time we've talked about Nagorno-Karabakh on Visual Politic. In April of this year, we told you how it looked like Armenia and Azerbaijan might be on the verge of signing a peace agreement. It was at the Munich Security Conference where Azerbaijani President Ilham Aliyev and Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan were discussing the matter in the same room. But clearly, we were wrong. International politics is unpredictable and no one has a crystal ball. In any case, it's important to recognise mistakes and it is precisely for that reason that we have made this video. So, the question we are asking today is, who is Russia going to support? And who are the United States and the European Union going to support? Why has this war broken out right now? What exactly is happening in Nagorno-Karabakh? Today, we are going to answer all those questions, but first, let's look at a little bit of history. A story without heroes. So at this point, I know what you're all wondering. Who are the good guys in this story? In principle, it is easy to empathise with Armenia. The Armenians are one of the most abused peoples in history. To give you an idea, during the First World War, the Ottoman Empire killed more than two million Armenians. And even today, Turkey refuses to acknowledge the Armenian genocide ever happened. What's more, Armenia is a democracy and, an interesting side note, was the first Christian country in history. And what can we say about Azerbaijan? It is a corrupt dictatorship with few rivals. The classic case of a country with enormous gas reserves whose profits have gone directly into the pockets of the ruling elites. This explains why the Azerbaijani dictator Ilham Aliyev has one of the world's greatest fortunes. The best thing we can say about this country is that it is one of the most secular countries in the Muslim world. However, if you think that the Azerbaijanis are the villains and that the Armenians are the avenging angels, I am sorry to say that you are wrong. In this story, there are simply no good guys. You see, for centuries, the Nagorno-Karabakh region was populated by both Armenian Christians and Azeri Shiite Muslims. This is confirmed by numerous censuses from the 19th century. At that time, both Armenia and Azerbaijan were part of the Russian Empire. However, in 1918, these two countries became independent. And guess what happened next? They went to war. A war that ended with Russia, at this time communist, invading those two countries again. So once more, Armenians and Azeris were forced to live together under the protective mantle of the Soviet Union. 
Since the time of Stalin, back in 1923, Nagorno-Karabakh has belonged to the Socialist Republic of Azerbaijan. Why? Well, because that's the way Stalin wanted it. And just try to find anyone who would dare to oppose him. However, things changed in 1998. At that time, Armenians living in Nagorno-Karabakh took advantage of the new political freedoms that Mikhail Gorbachev had put in place to cast a vote in the regional parliament. A vote in which they asked that the region cease to be part of Azerbaijan and become part of the Republic of Armenia instead. Armenians living in this area complained that the Baku government did not allow them to watch television or receive education in Armenian. For their part, the Azeris took to the streets to protest because they were not willing to give up the region. And the Armenians in Yerevan did the same. That's how the Nagorno-Karabakh war broke out. A war that did not end until 1994. This war caused more than 30,000 casualties, including lots of civilians, and it resulted in more than a million displaced people. The 850,000 Azeris who'd been living in the region had to relocate to other parts of Azerbaijan, and the 250,000 Armenians living in Azerbaijan had to move to Armenia. In other words, we are talking about a total ethnic cleansing that left indelible wounds on both sides. And you will say, so who won? Who won the war? Well, we could say that the winner was Armenia. Although Nagorno-Karabakh is officially a region of Azerbaijan, in fact we are talking about the so-called Artsakh Republic, a state where the police are Armenian, the currency they use is Armenian, and the official language is Armenian. The place is so controlled by Armenia that two of the last Armenian presidents were born in Stepanakert, that is, the capital of the Artsakh Republic. All this helps explain why this war has never ended. There was never a peace agreement, only a ceasefire was agreed. Since 1992, the OSCE, or the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, has been trying to bring both sides together to negotiate a territorial agreement. But this negotiating table is chaired by France, Russia and the United States. All these countries have huge Armenian diasporas, so Azerbaijan has never been willing to negotiate with them. Meanwhile, Armenia not only took Nagorno-Karabakh, but also conquered all the territories that connect this region to Armenia. That is, about 20% of the territory of Azerbaijan. And remember that there are more than 800,000 people who were expelled from the land where they had always lived. All this explains the anti-Armenian hatred professed in Baku. Hate that translates into statements like this. Our main enemies are Armenians of the world and the hypocritical and corrupt politicians under their control. Ilham Aliyev, Azerbaijan president. And, as you can imagine, for the Aliyev family, hatred of Armenia has become a major political tool. It is the perfect antagonist to justify all kinds of abuses of power. To give you an idea, people like Kim Kardashian are considered public enemies in Azerbaijan. I don't know if you know this, but Kim Kardashian is of Armenian origin. And for the Azerbaijani narrative, she is one more of the many Armenians who spread propaganda wherever they go. Consider that most of the Armenian population currently lives outside the country. There are more than 8 million Armenians living in countries like the United States or Russia. And that Armenian diaspora feeds Azerbaijan's persecution mania. Because if you think that Armenia is willing to negotiate, Boy oh boy, are you wrong. To date, Armenia is only willing to maintain the status quo. That is, to keep its Republic of Artsakh clean of Azeris, also in all the surrounding regions too. For example, in 2007, the foreign ministers of Armenia and Azerbaijan sat down to negotiate in Madrid. This led to the so-called Madrid Principles. These principles say that Armenia should allow the return of the Azeris who were living in Nagorno and afterwards allow all the inhabitants of the region, including the Azeris, to hold a referendum on self-determination. This referendum would be monitored by international security forces. This would imply that Armenia would withdraw its troops. And that is something that neither Yerevan nor the rest of the Armenian diaspora accept. Most significantly, the Armenian Association in the United States has rejected these principles as undemocratic. In other words, neither country is willing to give an inch to achieve peace. And that is why, to date, no major power has decided to support either side. So, what has changed since then? Well, one thing that has changed is the economy. 
In 1994, Armenia and Azerbaijan were two equally poor countries. We could say that they were in a kind of Mexican standoff. That is, both countries had similar amount of power and decided to approve a ceasefire. Since then, Armenia's economy has grown at the same rate as the rest of the countries in the region. Meanwhile, Azerbaijan's story has been completely different. In 1999, Azerbaijan discovered something that changed its economy forever. Deep beneath the Caspian Sea, a trillion cubic meters is waiting to be tapped. We are talking about the Shah Deniz gas fields in the Caspian Sea, one of the largest gas fields in the world. Suddenly, Azerbaijan's GDP skyrocketed. Take a look at this graph. To date, Azerbaijan has almost quadrupled Armenia's GDP, and all this wealth has been converted into an army. Since Azerbaijan has become a gas power, they have not stopped signing defense agreements with a whole host of countries, and that includes Russia, Israel, and Turkey. And at about that moment is when the powers in Baku said, Armenia, do you remember that ceasefire that we approved because of the Mexican standoff? Well, you're going to find out what we mean. Nagorno-Karabakh violence. Worst clashes in decades kill dozens. This is news from 2016. At that time, the war lasted just five days and resulted in 200 casualties. Despite the fact that Azerbaijan had more modern weapons, the Armenians managed to hold them off. Remember that the whole area is controlled by Armenian troops and that these troops are very well trained. In other words, Azerbaijan wanted to prove its superiority over Armenia and discovered that war was simply not a matter of money and weaponry. Just ask the Saudi Arabian army in Yemen. Once again, it seemed there was a certain balance of power at play. So now you might be thinking, so what has changed? Well, listen up, because to understand it, we have to pack our bags and travel to a completely different country. The Awakening of the Ottoman Giant July 15th, 2016 will be forever remembered as the date of the failed coup d'etat in Turkey. We have covered it several times here on Visual Politic. For Turkish President Erdogan, this coup was a golden opportunity. Traditionally, the Turkish army had been mainly Kemalist. In other words, they were in favour of a secular and Western Turkey. Erdogan, however, argued for the opposite. Many define his ideology as Neo-Ottomanism, that is, a return to the Ottoman Empire, a resurgence of Turkish nationalism. As you can imagine, in order to carry out such an expansionist policy, it is essential to have the army on your side. And that is why, after the coup d'etat, Erdogan changed the constitution and carried out policies like this. Erdogan purges army and judiciary after failed coup. And all this explains the turn that Turkish politics have taken since 2016. To give you an idea, Turkey is going through a very significant economic crisis. In 2013, the GDP was $951 billion. Six years later, in 2019, it is at $754 billion. However, despite the fact that the Turkish economy is going from bad to worse, Erdogan's army is present on all possible fronts. Take a look at this map. I present to you the doctrine of Mavi Vatan, the Blue Homeland. You're likely to get tired of hearing it mentioned in the coming months. Turkey wants to control all the seas surrounding it, the Mediterranean Sea, the Aegean Sea, and the Black Sea. This explains why the Turks are so present in the wars in Libya, and why they have entered into confrontations with Greece. But not only that, Turkey is also interested in controlling the Persian Gulf and the Caspian Sea. And you'll probably be thinking, why are they so interested in controlling these seas? Well, for two reasons. On the one hand, pure nationalist rhetoric. On the other hand, energy independence. Until recently, both the oil and gas consumed by Turkey came from two suppliers, Russia and Iran. Both countries have been traditional antagonists. However, things started to change in 2019. Turkey and Azerbaijan mark completion of TANAP pipeline to take gas to Europe. Remember how I told you that Neo-Ottomanism is a form of ethno-nationalism? That is, Turkish nationalism is not based on religion, nor on a political system, but on a common race and culture. The Azeris are a Turkic people, with very similar language, ethnicity and culture. And that's why both Aliyev and Erdogan get along so well. In previous visual politics videos, we told you about the Turkish military industry that has been revived thanks to Erdogan. Now, Turkey has its own missile launchers, laser weapons and even its own drones. For example, the Bakratar TB2 is very well known. Well, one of his biggest buyers is none other than Azerbaijan. 
Turkey-Azerbaijan deepen defense industry cooperation with new bilateral agreement. This news headline is from May 2020. By this time, the Azerbaijani army was already supplied with Turkish, Russian and Israeli weapons. And this means one thing in Baku. We can finally beat the Armenians. Not only did their dictator, Ilham Aliyev, think so, but so did the Azerbaijanis themselves. Azerbaijan protesters demand war after Armenia clashes. Around this time, some countries, like Canada, decided to stop adding fuel to the fire and banned arms sales to Azerbaijan. Meanwhile, Ankara has been encouraging Baku. To give you an idea, Turkish support of the Azerbaijani army is so evident that even on the website of the Ministry of Defense in Azerbaijan, we find pictures like this. But I know what many of you are thinking. Turkey is not the only country that has sold arms to Azerbaijan. So why is Turkish support so important in this war? Well, to understand this, we have to go back even further in time. Watch out, because a spy movie is about to start. The Impossible Alliances Syria 2012. Syrian rebels rise up against the dictator al-Assad. Many ask the US to intervene. At that time, the president was Barack Obama. And Barack Obama was tired of sending his army to fight wars in the Middle East. So, instead of making big military moves, he chose to call the guys at Langley. That's how the CIA created the Timber Sycamore Program. To this day, this program remains classified, so there is very little information about it. But what little we do know is that the CIA has been buying weapons on the black market. In the Balkans. And what kind of weapons? AK-47s, night vision goggles, and grenade launchers. These weapons were used to arm many of the groups fighting al-Assad. On the other hand, the CIA was training these fighters. And yes, I know what you're thinking, and you're right. Many of these groups were organizations of, how should we put this? Organizations of dubious stature. It's still not clear who received these weapons and training from the CIA, but it will not be the first time that the United States ends up giving weapons to those who will later on become its enemies. As soon as Donald Trump set foot in the White House, the Timber Sycamore program was canceled. Overnight, Tens of thousands of Syrian guerrillas with first-class military training were left without US support. And this is where Turkey comes in. This is how the Syrian National Army was born, a group of mercenaries in the service of Turkey. Each one charges between $1,500 and $2,000 a month and has the right to apply for Turkish citizenship. Remember I told you that the army of Azerbaijan is not as well trained as that of Armenia? Well, now Turkey has been able to solve this problem. It is estimated that between 700 and 1,000 Syrian mercenaries under contract to Turkey have been fighting in the war in Nagorno-Karabakh. Of course, Erdogan denies all these accusations, but news headlines like this, they speak for themselves. Nagorno-Karabakh. At least three Syrian fighters killed. Of course, some might say that these Syrian fighters were just passing by and said, come on, let's get involved in a war in a country that we don't know. Let's go fight over there and see what happens. But it seems more reasonable to think that Turkey has paid them to fight their war. So we have Azerbaijan on the one hand, which has four times the money than Armenia, large gas reserves, and the unconditional support of Turkey. So the question now is who is supporting Armenia? And for the time being, the answer is no one. One of its possible allies would be Iran. But for the moment, Iran has limited itself to securing its border by placing 200 tanks along the frontier to prevent the war from spilling over to their side. Russia is a traditional ally of Armenia. In fact, it has a military base in the city of Gumruri with more than 3,000 soldiers. Moreover, Armenia is a member of the Collective Security Treaty Organization, which is something like the Russian NATO. In principle, if Azerbaijan were to attack Armenia, Russia would be obliged to come to its defense. But don't forget that Nagorno-Karabakh is officially part of Azerbaijani territory. Technically, Azerbaijan has not invaded any country. It is simply trying to regain a territory that belongs to it. And now you're probably thinking, since when is Russia a country that respects international law? Is it not in Putin's interest to control the Caucasus? Of course it is. But for several years now, Moscow and Baku have been cultivating good relations. We explained it to you on Visual Politic two years ago. Russia and Azerbaijan need each other to be able to send their gas to Europe. What's more, Russia has serious problems in the Caucasus. Regions such as Chechnya and Dagestan are possible focuses of Islamic terrorism. And the last thing Moscow wants is to have Islamic attacks on its own territory. If 
all of a sudden Russia were to attack Azerbaijan, which is a Muslim country, Baku could very well strike back. The truth is that the European Union needs gas from Azerbaijan to reduce its dependence on Russia. In other words, Turkey is the only power that wants to enter this conflict. And all this explains Moscow's interest in trying to negotiate a ceasefire as soon as possible. Armenia and Azerbaijan agree ceasefire. However, this ceasefire has been agreed on without Turkey. And Erdogan has already said that it is just a truce. A truce for Armenia to withdraw all of its troops from Nagorno-Karabakh. No concessions. So hours after the ceasefire was approved, the Azerbaijani guns again fired missiles at Stepanakert. So now, the question is over. To you. Do you think Russia or NATO will end up getting involved in this conflict? Will we end up seeing the definitive end of this war with a peace agreement? More importantly, what do you think about Turkey's role in this conflict? To what extent are they responsible for what is happening in Nagorno-Karabakh? Well, leave your answers in the comments and, as always, I'll see you next time. Hanukkah, oh.